Okay, so our special guest today is Carver Pike. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing? Yeah, so I currently live in West Virginia, which uh, if you know anything about West Virginia, it's all, a lot of it's country, back roads, haulers, stuff like that. So it's great inspiration for horror writing, for sure. I've written several books just being here in, in town, so uh, that's quite nice. But um, I've been nominated for three Splatterpunk Awards. Haven't won the Splatterpunk yet, but um, been nominated. I've written probably... I think about 17 horror books, something like that. I also write in other genres so, or have written in other genres, so probably 30-something books total. But um, yeah. horror is where my love has always been, and um, that's kind of what I enjoy writing now, horror and dark fantasy. So uh, that's kind of my thing right now. So how, what drew you to the horror genre in particular? I've been watching horror ever since I was a little kid, like a lot of other horror authors. Um, my dad would would allow my parents were divorced at a young age and kind of both of them really, I guess, would let me watch horror movies depending on you know when I was living with them. And uh, all the way back to the USA channel used to have Commander USA. Every time I mention that online, no one seems to know what I'm talking about, but I swear he existed. <laughs> He had a he he would talk to his hand. He put cigar ash on his hand to make it look like eyes and a mouth. And he would talk to his hand and he wore a cape and was all just dressed funny like a superhero. And he would put on horror movies. I think it was like on Saturdays. So sometimes it would be something really cool like Friday the 13th or, you know, it would be Kingdom of the Spiders and stuff like that. Some of the older movies. And yeah. uh, I was just drew. I was drawn to that horror world. I loved Scooby Doo. But I always hated that at the end, it was always, um, you know, they would take the mask off and it would always just be another human doing the the horrific stuff. I wanted it to be like real ghosts and real, you know, scary stuff. And so I don't know, I, I guess as a young kid, I just was drawn to horror. And uh, when I was about 16 years old uh, in high school, I was visiting my grandfather out in Oklahoma and he had a typewriter and I just learned to type in school. So I sat down at the typewriter, started playing around with it, started writing a story. And that one was not horror. It was just a coming of age, kind of a really slice of life, kind of boring book, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But the next one was horror. And when I got home, I didn't have the typewriter anymore, but I would just write in spiral notebooks at school. And some of the some of the girls in my classes realized I was writing and started asking to read them. So I would give them I would I would fill up one notebook and put a big number one on it and hand it off to somebody and then start writing, you know, continue writing in the second notebook. Yeah. And and each of the books I wrote was probably about six notebooks long. And thinking back, it was crazy because I had no copies of any of this. So if somebody had lost, you know, notebook four, my whole story would have been ruined. So it's kind, of, <laughs> kind of crazy thinking about it now. I mean, it was basically like Wattpad back in the day. I mean, I was writing it as people were reading it. So it was pretty cool. And that's kind of, I guess, what got me started in writing horror. Yeah. Have you ever brought any of those into publishing that you've no. written when you were younger? No, sadly. In fact, I at one point, I've moved around a lot. I was working for a, a big company and they I had to relocate a lot of times. And in one of the places where I lived, I lived in Chicago and I lived in a very small condo and I just had no space for things. So I wound up throwing away a whole box full of notebooks and that was all those books from back then so yeah but it, i mean it was no no big deal i mean they were i've written they were childish kind of books at the time you know so but it would be nice to have them i guess that's sick so walk us through your process of developing a story idea where do your ideas normally come from Oh, man, they come from everywhere. I could be watching a show and just something tiny in the show will spark an idea. Uh, music does it a lot, especially when I'm just when I'm driving around in the car, I'll put on music and, you know, certain songs will just totally spark an idea. Um, just about everything does. I can just see something in town and be like, "Ooh, I got to write. There's a place down the street called Boyd Storage. No, Boyd Farm is what it says on the sign. And every time I pass it, I swear it says body farm. I mix up the letters in the and I've been wanting to write a body farm story ever since I saw that sign. So, I mean, really everything. And then my process for developing a story, I'm, 
I want to say that I don't do outlines, but that's actually changed. Uh, I've always been a pantser, just doing it by the seat of my pants. But lately, probably in the last uh, few years, I've started to kind of half outline. I'll open up a Word document and then I'll, you know, write chapter one and in all caps, just a sentence or two, I'll kind of say what I what I want to happen in that chapter. And then I'll go, I'll set up chapter two. And I do that as far as I can. I can't, I can't usually do it all the way through the book because I don't usually know the endings of my stories when I start. But yeah. I, you know, as I'm writing, I usually continue to do that process. I'll be like, oh, okay, this, I can do that. And you know, add another chapter. And, and it really helps because I started doing that because um, when I was, I used to write erotica and instead of werewolf shifter books, you know, werewolves were the big thing. I wanted yeah. to do something different. So I did sharks, like people that transform into sharks. And um, the book that I wrote had three points of view, I think in it. So there was like the main male character, main female character. And then there was like a third character and the only way I could ever make it link up and actually make sense in the end was to set it up that way. So I had to set, you know, chapter one was in, for example, let's say your name, chapter one was Crystal's chapter. Chapter two was Carver's chapter. Chapter three was Andrew or whatever the other character's name is. And yeah. then I had to say what I wanted to happen in each of those chapters and continue that process, making sure they were in order Crystal, Carver, Andrew, Crystal, Carver, Andrew, or I would never they wouldn't have made sense in the end. It wouldn't have linked up the way I needed it to. So, yeah. so that's kind of uh, my process now. A couple of authors that I've spoke to work the other way. They go from the ending, yeah, to the beginning, and I think it's amazing how they do it. I, I really do. Um, but that's not something I would ever be able to do myself. Right. I same thing. I've seen people. Some of these programs now. Um, I don't know. I don't know if Vellum has it. I think they might. I just don't use it. But some of the the <clears throat> excuse me, some of the writing programs now allow you to use kind of like the index card system where you can just write scenes and then move them around and put them in the order. I can't do that. Like I can't just write a bunch of scenes and then put them in order. Like I the yeah. book I have to write it kind of in order or or it'll just be a mess. So how do you how do you develop your characters? Uh, it's funny. I was just talking about this the other day. I, when I lived in Chicago, I can't remember his name again. I just saw it on a commercial. Uh, the director, I think it was the director of the movie Sideways, just kind of like a drama movie. Um, he came to a big party where the place where I worked, I can't, I don't really want to say the name of the company, but I was in charge of all the security there. And I knew he was a big director. I was writing a screenplay. It was actually a romantic comedy that I was writing. And I asked him, I said, you know, I, I knew I was taking a big risk because I could get in trouble with my job and stuff. But I said, hey, I, I've yeah. written a screenplay. I'm sure people do this all the time, but can I send it to you? And he was really cool about it. He let me send it to him. But then he wrote me back after and he said, well, the story was really funny. I laughed a lot. He said, but your character development was shit, basically. I mean, he said yeah. I, he, he didn't really have any reason to care for any of the characters. And that really hit me hard. It was like, but he was right. Like, I wasn't upset about it because I thought about it and said, you know, that's true, really, you know. So from that point on, I've put a lot of effort into character development. And I mean, so I don't do, I used to teach creative writing for a while. And there's there are worksheets that you can do where you can write, you know, Crystal is the main character. And then, you know, what is their favorite food? What is What are their likes and dislikes? And you can do all of that to try to develop a character. I don't take it that far because I feel like I'd spend way too much time on one character with that. <laughs> yeah. But I do try to give them something like uh, something that makes you care about each character, even the bad ones, you know, so that you kind of feel you either really hate somebody or you really love them in most of my books. I try not to make too many characters that are just like, eh, disposable. So, yeah. So how how do you describe the themes or have you got specific messages that are often explored in your work? Not, I, I didn't think I did, but apparently I've, I'm starting to, I'm, I'm a man of faith. I'm working on that and how horror ties into that, to be honest, because um, I go to church all the time and I pray all the time. I have a very close relationship with Jesus. And and so being a horror writer, that's it's, it's kind of a contradiction. And I'm trying to figure my way through all of that right now. But I have learned that in most of my books, I do have a good versus evil for sure. 
I mean, I like to think that good will usually beat evil in the end. I mean, not that I don't have some books where you're kind of left hanging or the evil does, you know, triumph in the end. But overall, I think most the message I use in most of my books would probably be something along those lines, just a good versus evil. But I don't know. It's funny. I love reading reviews of my books where someone will find something that I didn't even mean to do. And it happens yeah. often. I'll see, you know, oh, I can see what he was doing here. He was saying this and giving us this message. And I was like, oh, maybe <laughs> I didn't mean to, but <laughs> I didn't mean to. But that's awesome. I mean, if you got that from it. So I think that's pretty cool. So are any characters or any of your books based on personal experiences or your own fears? Uh, there, I have a book. OK, I have a series called Diablo Snuff that is about an evil entity that's kind of slinks its way into all facets of society. I mean, this thing, it's five books long, and every single book is something totally different, but it all involves this Diablo snuff. Uh, I don't want to say company, but it kind of is. It's like a entity of uh, evil. And um, in the first, second, third, I guess what would be the fourth book, it's called Slaughterbox. And it's about a guy that takes his girlfriend on a date to a movie theater that happens to be run by Diablo Snuff. They're trying to get kind of revenge on him. The main character's name is Kong, like King Kong. And yeah. um, in that, I used a lot of myself and his character. And when they're sitting in the movie theater, the previews that play, all he sees all of his childhood kind of playing out in previews of other movies. So it's like fake movies. And each one kind of shows part of his childhood. And a lot of that was my childhood. So just abusive type situation, things like that. So yeah. um, that's probably the one book that definitely touches on my some of my. And of course, I had to embellish a little bit. I mean, but but some of this, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the the things he sees in those teaser trailers yeah. relates to my childhood. So is there a scene that's been really difficult for you to write or challenging? Um, not really. Uh, I don't tend to... I, I've been labeled an extreme horror author, and some of my stuff is extreme. Like my Diablo Snuff series is definitely more extreme. Kin of the Fallen, which is my newest book, crosses into the extreme. Uh, but I won't write about... Uh, for example, children die in the stories and stuff like that. There may have been a rape somewhere in the story, but I don't I don't focus on it. Like I won't go through all the gritty details and stuff like that. So I try not to um I don't go as extreme as some people do. So this I don't think there's been anything that was really difficult. There've been books that were difficult. The the fifth book, the last book in Diablo Snuff is called The Maddening and it's massive. I mean, it's a huge book. It's probably like 130,000, 150,000 words, something like that. Yeah. And that book was more difficult than all the others because I always tell everybody, you can read the Diablo Snuff books really in any order as long as you read The Maddening last because it touches on all four of the other books. And so bringing all those characters and all those situations together and putting in little Easter eggs and stuff that you might remember from book one or two or four, you know, that was difficult was to bring it all back together for the big, massive final book. But it, I've told people often that that's probably my favorite of my books is The Maddening. But what sucks about it is it's the fifth book. So you have to read four other books to get to my favorite yeah. book. So, <laughs> but I think, I, I mean, I think they're all awesome. They start out with Diablo Snuff 1, which is a foreign evil. And that was meant to be a standalone book. It does leave you kind of hanging. It's very raunchy. And um, it's been it's been compared to like hostile. It's like that kind of an extreme sexual kind of horror and stuff. Yeah. Um, and it was meant to be just one book. But then I had a nightmare one night that com was was the basis for book two, The Grindhouse. I mean, this this was probably the most vivid nightmare I've ever had in my life. And I woke up and wrote a lot of this stuff down. And I was like, man, that's got to be part two to the Diablo Snuff series. And then from there, I wrote the third, which is Passion and Pain, and then Slaughterbox, and then The Maddening. So, yeah, just bringing them all together was was difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. So which one's been, which book of yours has been your most popular with the readers? My most popular is probably Faces of Beth. That's the one that just uh, went through and made it 
pretty far in the Books of Horror uh, indie author brawl. And Brian Keene wrote the introduction to that. Uh, so it's been a pretty popular book. It's That's the one I'd say. Fantastic. So have you got any memorable reactions from your readers that stand out to you? I was... <laughs> I was trying to, th- I actually listened to one of your, I listened to um, Colt's interview just last night and Colt, thank you for mentioning me. That was awesome. I appreciate it. And I heard you ask him that question. So I was trying to think on it and I was like, man, I can't really, there's nothing that stands out other than I absolutely love meeting my readers, like any convention or signing, anybody that comes up, especially, I love when people come up and tell me like they were so excited to see me or they were, or they were nervous to meet me and stuff like that. Cause I, I can't believe it. Like I'm just an, you know, an average Joe writing books. So I think yeah. that that's really cool. One memory that stands out that I think is really funny actually was on the um, erotica side of things. I went to a book signing and um, <laughs> this girl came down. I was by the bar with a bunch of the other authors and stuff. And uh, this girl came down and she said that her roommate had fallen asleep upstairs. She was a huge fan of mine. And would I come wake her up like at the to come down to the party and stuff and how much she love it. So I went upstairs with one of my friends, uh, my friend Derek. He's an author, too. <clears throat> and we went upstairs to the room and she was asleep. And we both we climbed in bed next to her and just kind of like each on side of her. And we were just like <laughs> touching her shoulder like, hey, wake up. Hey, wake up. Come downstairs. She woke up and freaked out. Now, thinking back, it was probably kind of mean to do because nobody wants to be seen as soon as they wake up and stuff. But we thought, I mean, she loved it. You know, she's written me several times to tell me how she remembers that and how awesome it was and stuff. But but yeah, thinking back, it was kind of mean. I don't think anybody really wants to be seen when they first wake up. But we had a lot of fun with it and she was cracking up afterwards. But that's probably the memory that stands out to me the most. That's funny. Okay. So have you got any exciting projects that you're currently working on that you can share? Yeah, I'm working on the full length novel for Cannibal Caviar, which is a a story that I wrote for a book called Exits that I wrote with Aaron Beauregard, Daniel Volpe and Roland Bercy Jr. Uh, We wrote it under Jack Bantry's Spider Punk Zine. He sold like limited copies of this uh, kind of anthology with just the four of us. And I really liked my story in it. And it's short because it was an anthology. So I decided to expand it. So I'm turning that Cannibal Caviar story into a full length novel. So for anybody who was not able to grab a copy of Exits because, like I said, it was a limited run. It wasn't on Amazon or anything like that. So anybody who didn't get a chance to read it, you will now. But it will be – I'm taking that story, making it the beginning of the book, and then I'm adding two full sections after that. So that will be just the beginning of of this book, what was in Exits. And then I'm also working on uh, the prequel to my Headlice book, Scalp, my parasitic Headlice. I'm reading, working on the prequel to that. I'm just starting touch. I'm just touching the beginning of Kin of the Fallen 2. And then I, I have so much stuff going on, but that's, uh, I'm also working on a faith based book on a different, under a different name that'll be kind of like a supernatural thriller that I'm excited about too. Yeah. So do you work on multiple books at one time or do you just like skitter between all of them? What I I tend to juggle. I, I work on multiple books at once until I get to a certain point. Like in the beginning stages, I kind of work on several books and then usually one will kind of stand out from the others and then I'll start focusing on it until it's done. Fantastic. So what advice would you have for aspiring writers who want to break out into the horror genre? I know you've had many people say, just just keep writing. I mean, to me, I always say it's meant, it's basic math. I mean, if you want to finish a book, even if you write five words a day, it's eventually going to add up to a full length, you know, novella or novel, whatever you're working on. So that's one. I always say just keep writing, but also be careful uh, what kind of advice you listen to. I mean, I'm giving you advice right now, but there's so much advice out there on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok now. And just take it as a grain of salt. I mean, if you really listen to all the advice out there, you'll never write a book. Yes, there are rules. Yes, there's you know guidelines and stuff to writing. But sometimes you got to break the rules a little bit, um, especially now that everybody's you know indie publishing and you know, self-publishing. 
Uh, so just be careful because I've seen stuff on Twitter where people have said things like, please, for the love of God, uh, authors, please stop doing this. And then someone else will say, I can't stand it when an author does this in their books. If you look at all those things and never do anything that bothers anybody or triggers anybody, you'll never write a book. So yeah. I say just throw that out the window for the most part, unless it's obviously a very established author who's written a book on writing. Then, yeah, you might want to you know, read what they have to say. And again, just decipher it, see what makes sense for you and get rid of what doesn't. There are a lot of triggers these days, aren't there? With uh, yeah. writing horror a lot. Yeah. yeah. And everybody thinks they're a genius. Everybody thinks that they're the, they know it all. So just be careful with all those know-it-alls out there, you know, trying to teach everybody how it should be done. So where can we find your books, Carver? <laughs> I'm on Amazon. Everything is on Amazon and it's all under KU. So if you're enrolled in the KU program, uh, the Kindle Unlimited program, all my books are available there. And if you want signed copies of any of my paperbacks, just go to carverpike.com and I have everything available there. Fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Not really. Just thank you for having me. It was fun. <laughs> it's great talking <laughs> to you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're very welcome. Well, thank you for being on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure.